So, hi, I'm Vlad, and uh, this is joint work with Alexandro Agatke, Andrei Voinescu, and Kostin Raiju. So, let me tell you what I mean by data center load balancing. So, let's say you've got a service running on a, a server inside a data center. As your service gains more popularity, you're probably going to want to deploy more uh, replicas of the same server. However, you might want them to be accessed by the clients in a uniform manner. You might want all of them to go to the same uh, IP of the service, which we call virtual, uh, which we call the service's virtual IP, or VIP in short. So let's see how data center load balancing is performed today. Uh, the administrator deploys a number of machines called MUXs inside the data center. These MUXs uh, are responsible for deciding which connection goes where. Uh, obviously, packets uh, uh, belonging to a connection have to consistently hit the same server, otherwise the connection will break. This is called connection affinity. Now, the MUXs speak uh, BGP to the border router and advertise the service's virtual IP as being accessible in one hop. So when a pa packet comes in, it reaches the border router. The border router uses ECMP to forward it to one of the MUXs. And then the MUX encapsulates the packet and sends it over to the server's direct IP, or DIP in short. Now, the, the, the server replies directly to the client, bypassing the MUXs completely. This is highly advantageous since uh, uh, downstream traffic tends to be uh, a lot larger than upstream traffic. So how do, uh, do the MUXs decide which connection goes where? A strongman approach would simply be to hash incoming packets as they come in. In this case, we've got only one server, so the hash function is going to send all connections over to it. Now let's see what happens when the, uh, an administrator decides to add another server to handle with a load. So, some connection, uh, so the hash function is going to uh, send some connections over to the second server. The second server ob obviously doesn't have any state for those connections, and it's going to reset them. Now, all major load balancing uh, load balancer vendors use uh, per flow state in order to deal with this issue. So uh, basically, whenever a, a packet belonging to a new flow comes in, the MUX hashes it and then remembers the choice that it made. So in this case, adding a second server has no effect on pre-existing con uh, connections, and only new connections are going to hit it. Now let's see what happens when we add the second MUX. Obviously, the border router is going to uh, send some of the, the pre-existing connections to the second MUX. Now, the second MUX does not share any flow state with the first one, so it got, it's going to uh, rehash all of, the, all of the connections that hit it. In this case, uh, the blue flow gets rehashed to the second server, and it breaks. Now, let's get back to the scenario with a single MUX. Uh, SYN flood attacks are common in today's internet. Servers can use SYN cookies to effectively mitigate these attacks. However, MUXs have no choice but to establish flow state for each and every incoming SYN packet. So what uh, SYN floods do is that is they eat up the MUX's uh, state memory. Now the MUX is only left with a hash function and we're basically back to the straw man approach. The key takeaway here is that stateful designs don't necessarily guarantee connection affinity, and attempting to fix them is going to add a lot of complexity and is going to have high costs in terms of performance. Now, with Beamer, we set out to do stateless load balancing. Uh, that means that the MUXs do not keep any kind of per flow state, and instead they uh, load balance the packets independently. Now, obviously, when a connection gets reassigned to a different server, it might break. So in order to deal with that, we use the state already stored in the server in order to redirect the straight packets. So the two main points are that packets get forwarded independently and straight packets get redirected. The mechanism where bike packets get redirected is called daisy chaining. So in this case, uh, server two has a couple of ongoing connections. But let's say that uh, the administrator wants to power it off uh, because uh, it wants to, uh, to take the server down for maintenance. First, it has to drain it of connections. So it starts off by reassigning all of the server's traffic over to server two. Now, server two does not have any state for uh, these two connections, so it forwards the packets over to server one and only services new connections locally while waiting for daisy chain connections to die off. 
So when load balancing packets, we, we are obviously going to have to use some kind of hashing scheme. Now, uh, we are looking for three main things when picking a hashing scheme. First, we want low churn. That means that whenever uh, uh, changes to the server pool uh, occur, we want uh, there to be as little tra traffic getting reallocated. We also want uh, the hashing scheme to uh, spread traffic as evenly as possible across the servers. And we would also like uh, uh, there to be as few rules in the data plane required. Now, ECMP typically does modulo and hashing. It offers good load balancing and only requires one rule per uh, server. However, even small changes to the uh, server pool may result in most of the traffic getting redirected. This is a huge issue. Consistent hashing offers load, uh, load churn, but uh, it, it, it may allocate huge portions of the traffic to a few unlucky servers, so the load balancing isn't that good. However, it still requires few rules. Finally, we've also got maglev hashing. Maglev hashing was introduced by Google in their maglev paper. Uh, it has low churn and good, offers good load balancing, but it requires significantly more rules in the data plane. So uh, with Beamer, we simply added an in indirection layer. So we pick a number of buckets that is strictly larger than the maximum number of ser servers we expect to have in our deployment at any one time. Uh, each bucket is assigned to a server, and the bucket-to-server bucket server mappings are known by all of the muxes. Uh, a centralized controller maintains these mappings so the controller can implement whatever hashing scheme it desires. Uh, packets hitting the muxes are simply hashed modulo the number of buckets, and they are sent over to the corresponding server. So let's take a look ha at how Beamer uh, uh, works. Um, for each of the buckets, the muxes know what, uh, which server is responsible for the bucket. And it also knows what, the pre uh, what, the, uh, what previous server was handling the bucket, as long, uh, along with the timestamp of the reassignment. Uh, in this case, we've got a fresh co uh, deployment consisting of only one server, so all four buckets are assigned to it. Now, let's see what happens when we try to add another server. Now, obviously, for, uh, for the sake of good load balancing, we are going to have to reassign half of the buckets over to server two. In this case, buckets three and four. Obviously, the green pack, uh, packet uh, used to uh, hits, the green, uh, the green flow hits uh, bucket three, and it gets reassigned over to server two. Now, server two does not have any uh, f uh, connection state for the green flow. However, all packets uh, load balanced by Beamer also contain the previous server as long as, uh, along with the timestamp of the reassignment. So server two knows that server one probably has state for the green flow. So it forwards the packets over to server one. Of course, uh, new connections are going to be serviced locally while waiting for daisy chain connections to die off. Now, um, the design of Beamer muxes is very simple. And as such, our muxes require less memory than uh, uh, their stateful counterparts. Uh, and of course, they incur a lot less cache thrashing during normal operation. Uh, this simple design lends itself to hardware implementations. In our, in our particular case, we've chosen to implement it in P4. Now, all of the muxes uh, treat the, pa uh, the packets exactly the same way, so it doesn't matter which packets hit, hit which muxes. All the muxes are perfectly interchangeable. And finally, uh, the muxes are resilient to sin flood attacks. This all comes at a small co cost, however. Uh, each encapsulated packet requires an extra 16 uh, bytes. So we have a software implementation running on top of NetMap. And we also wanted to compare it against uh, a stateful solution. However, all stateful load balancers are currently closed source. So we've implemented a stateful version of Beamer. Uh, this, uh, this version also runs on top of NetMap, and it offers performance similar to that of Google's Maglev presented at, the, at this conference two years ago. So we, start, uh, so we set out to measure uh, the performance of a single MUX. We bombard the MUX with uh, uh, sy synthetic traffic of the, uh, uh, consisting of packets uh, of different sizes. On one core, Beamer can do 6 million packets per second and can achieve line rate for packets larger, in, uh, larger than 255, uh, 256 bytes. 
Adding a second core allows our MUX to do line rate for packets of all sizes. Uh, in comparison, Stateful does less than 3 uh, million packets per second, which is roughly half the performance of our, uh, of our MUX. Now, what about realistic traffic? We've taken a look at the recent Maui trace and replayed upstream HTTP packets back to back. Uh, our MUX can do 36 gigabits of, uh, per second of upstream traffic. Now, since uh, downstream traffic on oh, seven cores. Now, since downstream traffic is 15 times larger, uh, that translates to roughly 540 gigabits per second. Assuming uh, each server can source anywhere from one to 10 gigabits per second, we roughly estimate that one MUX can cater to anywhere from 50 to 500 servers. We've also deployed Beamer uh, on a small test bed. All machines are equipped with 10 gig NICs. Uh, we've used the IBM Rack switch as a, uh, as a border router, and we've used mostly software MUXs, although we have deployed one P4 MUX running on top of the P4 reference implementation to check for interoperability. So in this scenario, uh, we wanted to see how MUX churn is handled. Uh, we start off by bombarding a couple of servers with iperf traffic. Uh, at the very start, there's only one, uh, there's only a P4 MUX running. P4, uh, this MUX is running on top of the P4 reference implementation, which uses leap pcap for packet forwarding, so the performance is not that great. It's only 55 megabi megabits per second. At the 60-second mark, we had another MUX. The, uh, the a new, newly added MUX uh, uh, advertises its presence to the, to the border router. And uh, obviously, since it has a 10 gigabit NIC, the, the throughput uh, rises all the way over to 10 gigabits per second. And then we had a couple of more MUXs at uh, each of them 60 seconds apart. As you can see, traffic scales organically as we add more MUXs. Next, we simulate uh, MUX failures. A MUX failure basically ba black holes all traffic destined to a MUX, while the uh, border router notices that the BCP session has died. Um, uh, dropping any one of the MUXs uh, corresponds to a, uh, to, uh, to a decrease in throughput. Uh, during all of these experiments, none of the IPERF connections were dropped. So MUX failures and churn are handled uh, smoothly by Beamer. Next up, we wanted to see how well, uh, how good of a job Beamer does when load balancing traffic across multiple servers. We start, start off with one server and we hit it with uh, 10 million packets per second of traffic. Uh, then we keep adding, uh, gradually keep adding servers uh, every, 30 sec uh, every 30 seconds. And as we can see, Beamer does a good job of spreading load quite evenly across all of the servers. Next, we tested connection affinity under sin flood attacks. So uh, we had 700 running connections that were being serviced by eight servers. In the background, we had a sin flood attack running. It, uh, it consisted of uh, 1 million packets per second. Uh, this table shows the number of dropped connections. So, uh, the, uh, the use case we were going for was basically draining uh, servers of connections. As you might recall, SYN floods basically flush out uh, any stateful load balancer's state. Unsurprisingly, uh, the stateful load balancer lost connections. The number of connections lost is roughly uh, proportional to the number of servers that we attempted to drain. In comparison, uh, Beamer dropped no connections. Daisy chaining ensured perfect connection affinity. And that's, next, let's took a, take a look at the control plane. So the bucket to dip mappings are managed by a centralized controller. The controller is fault tolerant. Um, the controller uses the Zookeeper cluster to store its state and also to disseminate the bucket to server mappings. Uh, Zookeeper is a reliable key value store, and it also scales well for write one, read many uh, workloads, as we have with uh, Beamer. Now, uh, all of the MUXs and the controller have uh, the same view of the data plane. Let's say that the system administrator wishes to add a few more machines uh, to, the, uh, pool of, uh, to the pool of servers. So what that basically entails is changing the, uh, the data plane. 
So the controller starts by writing uh, the update to the control plane inside the, in the Zookeeper cluster. As soon as it finishes, Zookeeper sends out notifications to all of the MUXs, uh, telling them that there is a new version available. Then the MUXs start downloading the new version of the data plane. Now, some MUXs are going to be uh, fast, are going to download the, the update faster than uh, others. However, that is not a problem. Daisy chaining allows our MUXs to have transient periods of staleness. So uh, we've deployed 100 MUXs and a three-node Zookeeper cluster on Amazon EC2. We've simulated a very large uh, network surface consisting of 64,000 servers, and the number of buckets we picked is 6.4 million. That's 100 buckets per server, giving us a very good gra granularity when uh, reassigning traffic. And next, we proceeded to stress test the controller. When doing something truly drastic, like adding or removing 32,000 servers, the controller takes anywhere from one to 10 seconds to update Zookeeper. Once the, control, uh, the updates are atomic from the uh, MUXs point of view. Once the controller finishes, the MUXs take an additional half a second to six seconds to download the new data plane information. In the meantime, they generate one gigabyte of control traffic or roughly 10 megabytes per MUX. Now, there are a number of things that we haven't discussed in the paper. First up, uh, Beamer has support for MPTCP, although that support is limited to uh, deployments no larger than 64,000 servers. We also have a mechanism whereby we minimize the number of rules required in the MUXs from one rule per bucket all the way down to one rule per server. Uh, uh, that might be highly advantageous for hardware deployments. And there are also uh, some uh, corner cases in which daisy chaining does not protect against reset connections. Uh, we discuss how we handle those corner cases in the paper. So in conclusion, we've presented Beamer, which is a stateless load balancer that uses daisy chaining to ensure connection affinity. Uh, one MUX can do 36 gigabits per second of tra uh, upstream traffic on seven cores, which roughly translates to 450 gigabits per second of downlink traffic. It has a scalable and fault tolerant control plane, and it's available on GitHub. Uh, you can also find us during the process session. Uh, thanks for your attention, and I'll be happy to take questions. Hi, I'm Charles Kayser from the Hello. University of Pennsylvania. Um, have you done any analysis of how much extra traffic daisy chaining generates and if like the congestion effects within your network? So we haven't really looked into the congestion effects, but we have uh, run some experiments that uh, indicate how much the traffic is daisy chained. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have a backup slide for that, but please refer to the paper. Well, I'll ask one. You know, if you had the mechanism that we saw in the previous paper, how would that have affected the design of your system? Uh, what do you mean by that? <laughs> well, well, I mean, uh, I, I mean, I think I think I know what you mean. So the uh, <laughs> so the previous paper basically handles load balancing within a single rack. So it's a single layer to domain. We do it across uh, across mul uh, multiple layer two domains. So packets get, uh, it doesn't matter what kind of topology your data center has, packets will get routed nonetheless. You buy that, Joao? Where is he? <laughs> we'll take that as a cent. All right. Are you on? Okay. This is my co-author. Well, I probably argue that the um, encapsulation is not. Uh, uh, important, so you can actually work on a layer three as well. The reason why we decided to operate a layer two was that actually it was a design decision because it's easier to process in the kernel and uh, that actually got us IPv6 support for free. But doesn't mean that you cannot use a different encapsulation, I would argue. Yes, we made uh, so we targeted IPv4 networks 
exclusively. So we cannot, we, uh, we had no other way of conveying uh, what, the previous, uh, what, the, uh, what the previous server was and what the timestamp of the reassignment was. We actually needed 12, uh, 12 bytes of information per packet. Uh, the, the other four bytes uh, are, uh, pertain to some other details. Please see the paper for them. But essentially, yes, we needed 12 bytes of uh, uh, 12 bytes of extra information per packet, and, and we had to stick them somewhere. So we chose a non-standard IP option. All right, let's thank our speaker again. Thank you.